Welcome to the Personalized Medicine Podcast. This is the place where scientists, clinicians, and entrepreneurs discuss the progress of this rapidly developing field. I am your host, Alexander Yahensky. Let's start. Three, two, one, and we are live. Welcome to the new episode of the Personalized Medicine Podcast. Today, we are discussing the topic of genetic risk factors in psychiatric disorders. And I am very happy to welcome on our podcast a scientist whose contribution to this field over the last 15 years was of paramount importance, Professor Naomi Vray. Naomi holds joint appointments at the Institute for Molecular Bioscience at the Queensland Brain Institute within the University of Queensland in Australia. She's an Australian National Health and Medical Research Council Leadership Fellow and a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science. She has published more than 300 research papers focusing on quantitative genetics and genomics methods with application to psychiatric and neurological disorders. Naomi is a key member of International Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, together with which she contributed immensely to identification of genetic risk factors of schizophrenia. I have just briefly scratched the surface of Naomi's accomplishments and contributions to this field. And it is my great pleasure to welcome her on the podcast. So, Naomi, thanks so much for joining us today. Oh, thanks for having me, Alexander. Perfect. Then uh, let's dive into it uh, right away. So I would like to start with your story. And throughout your career, you have been working on the intersection of psychiatric diseases and genetics. And I want to know what got you interested in this field in the first place and what excites you most about this topic today. Oh, yes. Um, well, I guess my, my early training was actually in quantitative genetics, which is actually the mathematical theory that underpins our knowledge of complex genetic traits. Um, so I guess my, you know, my basic talent, I suppose, is in maths and my interest is in genetics. And then, you know, you can put those two things together and apply them to many, many different applications. But I suppose I have a bit of a passion for, I guess, helping to improve the lives of those affected by psychiatric disorders. So um, that's the way I've put those th three things together, genetics, statistics and, and disorders of the brain. And really, it's really been the last decade where technological advances have allowed us to really address questions which people have been asking for a long time, but we've never been able to uh, investigate until now. So yes, it's a, an exciting time in, in genetics of psychiatric disorders right now. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think it's a great time. Uh, and uh, also that something that you mentioned that a lot of fields are coming together. Um, a lot of sciences uh, are merging and there's a lot of interesting research actually coming uh, from the intersection of different fields such as mathematics, uh, genetics and computational biology. Yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah, and uh, some of your recent work has been focusing on polygenic risk scores for schizophrenia and some of the other neurological disorders. Perhaps you can tell our audience a little bit uh, about what exactly polygenic risk score is and how it is determined. Well, that sounds like a simple question, but let me just take a, a few steps back to, to unpick that a bit. So, you know, we know that common diseases and disorders are what we call complex genetic traits. So again, let me unpack that statement. By common diseases and disorders, I mean the diseases that are common in society like heart disease, immune disorders, diabetes, cancers, as well as the psychiatric and neurological disorders. And by complex, I mean that we can see that there's an increased risk in getting one of those diseases if you have a family member, which is a good indicator that there's a genetic component. But the way in which that incre increased risk is um, transmitted through families is not clear and obvious. So there's a genetic contribution, but it's it's a complicated one. And we also know that there's other risk factors, non-genetic risk factors. Uh, so in fact, there's likely to be many, many things that aggregate together. And when you, you know, you have to have increased risk across a whole burden of those to, to, uh, to be uh, affected. In the past, in order to understand the genetic contribution, we would study families and recognise that we can see this increased risk in, in um, being affected if you have a family member. 
But the technology of the last decade now allows us actually to directly measure things in, in DNA. And what's been shown in the last decade is all these common disease, diseases are essentially polygenic. That means we found that there's literally thousands of DNA risk variants that are associated with these disorders. So how do we identify those risk variants? Well, we identify them by studying the DNA of people who have the disease and people that, who don't. And we look for the variants which are more common in those who have the disease. So what, what do I actually mean by DNA variant? I mean, we're looking at the DNA code. So there's three billion base pairs in the DNA code, and, and most of those are the same in all people. Um, but we're studying the ones where some people have one DNA letter and other people have, have the other. So by recognizing that these diseases are polygenic um, and that there's literally thousands of risk variants, what that also means is that every single one of us carries risk variants for every single disorder. Um, but if you carry a high burden of risk variants for a disorder, then, then you have an increased risk of getting that disorder. So a polygenic risk score is a count of the number of risk variants that you, you have, the ones that we've identified. And we have shown in research settings that those high polygenic risk scores are, are associated with, with getting the disease. Um, so in a nutshell, that's what a, a polygenic risk score is, but I'd like to say a little bit more um, because although it's using genetic information, I just want to make clear it's not a diagnostic genetic test and, and it can't be because, as I told you, the common diseases are, are complex. So first of all, we know it's not just genetics so that impacts risk. And so obviously a genetic predictor is not ever going to be capturing all the, all the risk. And also the polygenic risk score is actually only capturing part of the genetic information. So I guess the way to think about a polygenic risk score is really just like a biomarker. So just as we uh, are used to thinking of a measure of cholesterol as a, a measure of your risk of getting uh, heart disease, a polygenic risk score can be, can be seen as a, a risk marker in that, that same way. But I guess, um, you know, these days there is quite a lot of discussion about whether we should be using polygenic risk scores in, uh, in health settings. And one reason we're having that discussion is because from a single evaluation of your DNA, which just costs less than $100, you can generate these polygenic risk scores for, you know, many, many diseases. And so it's a very cost-effective cost way to generate uh, biomarkers. And so, you know, you could almost imagine a time when we all have our genetic information held as part of our health record. And then at various times throughout our life, whenever it seems relevant, we access that um, data and run the latest algorithm and get a risk prediction of uh, a particular disease that we, uh, is, is of importance to us at that, at that point. Yeah, so as I say, there's a lot of interest in use of polygenic risk scores. Um, and particularly, there's a lot of discussion in the context of population screening for, for example, heart disease and cancers. And the reason there's lots of discussion for those diseases is that we already have screening programs. So, for example, uh, in most many countries, when you turn 50, you get a kit through the post sent by your health authority. Um, and you send back a small sample of your feces and then they run a, a test to see if there's blood in any sign of, of blood. In your feces and if there is then you're invited for colonoscopy screening so this is a very effective way to uh, screen for colorectal cancer well it is an effective way if people actually return the kits but one of the problems is that people don't return the kits and so <coughs> you then think well how do you follow up to people how do you make sure that people how do you encourage people to send those kits back well uh, one thing that's being investigated is, you know, if you have a high polygenic risk score, those are the people you might want to concentrate on to say um, you're at a high genetic risk. It's really important for you to be returning this this kit. And, you know, you know what it's like. We're, we as individuals, we tend to follow the diseases which we know we have family members affected, you know, and, and that's a good thing that, you know, family history is a, is a predictor. But there's many people who will end up um, being affected by a common disease who don't have any family history. And I guess a polygenic risk score can just help identify those people. So that was actually a very long answer to a very short question. <laughs>
No, but it, but it was a, a very, a very uh, detailed and very, uh, answer to a very important question, I think. And uh, you put um, this polygenic risk score uh, in a very good perspective. And I think it will help our listeners to understand actually how, how we should think about it, uh, not as a definitive diagnosis, but actually as an early indicator of a potential risk uh, yeah, or uh, increased probability of getting a certain disease. And you mentioned already that uh, for different types of cancer, uh, such as colorectal cancer, these types of analysis are quite common. But also in your recent paper uh, in uh, Journal of American Medical Association for Psychiatry, uh, you mentioned that psychiatry and neurological disorders are uh, rather lagged behind uh, in terms of the use of genetic data. So how can clinical psychiatry catch up now? Um, well, actually, that's not quite true. I think um, the use of genetic data for common disease is new across the board because it's only the last 10 years that we've been able to make these discoveries and it's only now that we can see that there's uh, ways to use them in, a, in clinical settings. So it's not that the point we, weren't we were making wasn't about uh, the use of genetic data. It was just about technologies in general that many other branches of medicine uh, have uh, you know, different types of technologies, many types of uh, tests which help with diagnosis, and we, we don't have that in psychiatry. Um, but yes, this uh, this paper is a kind of an opinion paper where we were talking about the um, the potential use of polygenic risk scores in the context of psychiatry. And the point we were trying to make was that it's where we think uh, the use of the risk scores uh, could be applicable is actually different to what's being thought about for heart disease and cancers because in those contexts people are thinking about the use in, in population screening and the point that we were making is that um, we feel like in psychiatry the place where polygenic risk scores could be useful is actually when people, people are already presenting with symptoms. So uh, it is an opinion paper and, you know, my contribution, my expertise is actually in the statistics and the genetics and kind of saying what could be possible. Um, and in that opinion paper, I kind of teamed up with more clinically focused researchers because I'm not really qualified to, you know, to make the statements about how it could be used in practice. So my co-authors include Graham Murray, who's from the University of Cambridge, John McGrath, who um, holds a joint appointment at University of Queensland here with me and also Aarhus University in Denmark, and also Ian Hickey from the University of Sydney. So those are all um, researchers who are psych also psychiatrists practicing. And um, then the fourth person on our team is Janine Austin, who's from Vancouver in Canada, and she's well known for uh, leading the development of genetic counselling in the context of psychiatric disorders. So we kind of came together to make sure that we were um, all agreed on a, a kind of a consistent message of how polygenic risk could be used in the context of psychiatry. Yeah, so in, in this opinion paper, we kind of contrasted how polygenic risk scores could be used in psychiatry compared to the way they're being discussed for, say, heart disease and cancers. So at the moment, there's a lot of discussion for the use of uh, polygenic risk scores for those common diseases because for heart disease and cancers, there's, there's uh, population screening programs. And so polygenic risk scores would be applied in a population screening setting. But in our um, opinion, that's not where they should be used for psychiatry. For We feel that in psychiatry, where polygenic risk scores could be useful is actually when people first present with, with symptoms. And so my understanding is one of the issues is that um, often when young people present, the you know, they're presenting with kind of general anxiety, depression, other symptoms which make it hard to know what trajectory that that person is on um, but obviously a doctor has to make decisions about you know what what's the best way forward for them and as part of that decision making for example if they know that person's got you know very strong family history that of psychiatric disorders that might may influence the way in which they um, uh, make those decisions and so what we're proposing is that polygenic risk scores could be used in in a similar way to, to family history. And we know that many people don't have family history, even though there's a very strong genetic component. And although that sounds contradictory, it's actually exactly what you expect when a disorder is polygenic. 
And so what we're pre proposing is that um, you know, we could, uh, a doctor could use a polygenic risk score by uh, you know, having the polygenic risk score generated for people as they come through the clinic. And if individuals have a very high polygenic risk score, that then might contribute to their decision making. So it's a, just a small piece of information, but the reason why we think it's useful to evaluate is because uh, that small piece of information is you know, very cheap, cheap to generate. Um, in future, uh, everyone's likely to have genetic information as part of their health record. Um, uh, it's, it's just a small piece of information which could be useful for a few people. And so it, it's um, appropriate to see if it can be used. Absolutely. Uh, I, I think this um, polygenic risk score has a great promise uh, in terms of uh, how we think about diseases or how doctors think about prescribing uh, certain therapeutic strategies. Um, but maybe what can we still do to improve the clinical utility of polygenic risk scores? Because as you mentioned, for now, it's just the very early indication that a certain person might be more inclined to a specific uh, disease or specific phenotype. But how can we extract even more value from, from that polygenic risk score data? Well, first of all, I think what I'm saying is that for some individuals, it's a very useful piece of inf information. Um, and how can we make them more accurate? Well, obviously, the polygenic risk score is built with the knowledge of the risk variants that we have identified. And as I say, we identified those variants by comparing the DNA of people who have we know have a disorder to the DNA of people that don't. And so the bigger those discovery data sets, the more accurate our predictors can be. So if we increase our, those discovery data sets, that will, that will be good. And of course, you get yourself in a feedback loop because if we were to have um, used polygenic risk scores, then you'd have um, more people with um, clinical information and genetic data which could feed back into that discovery. But again, it's important to say that, um, as I said before, polygenic risk scores only capture the genetic contribution to risk and only part of that genetic contribution. So we know that um, there's actually going to be an upper limit on the accuracy of these scores. And so, you know, the expectation is that uh, we would use these polygenic risk predictors together with other predictive information, just as we do for heart disease, where at the moment we use risk predictors which are based on things like BMI, smoking status, family history, cholesterol level. And now people are talking about adding polygenic risk scores to that uh, you know, multivariate predictor. And I think the same would happen in psychiatry. It's just that at the moment we don't have those other predictors and, and um, the polygenic risk score is kind of the starting place to build those predictors. Yeah, understood. And... Uh... As you mentioned, we need to uh, put a lot of different data points uh, in the perspective and combine them, uh, and uh, that can provide a really high clinical utility then for, for those patients uh, if you could really leverage multiple sources of information, including the genetic data, uh, phenotypic data, clinical history of the patient, to uh, draw the best picture of a uh, patient's health. and. Uh, even within psychiatric disorders, the discrepancy between uh, different different diseases that are kind of put under the same umbrella is often uh, quite quite strong. Uh, take depression, for example. Uh, there are very different genetic and other causes of uh, different subtypes of uh, of this condition. So, how can we use polygenic risk score to essentially stratify patients, assign patients? with the best therapeutic for their specific condition? So there's a few things in there. To start with, um, we see that there's a very high genetic relationship between different disorders. And um, we often talk about the heterogeneity within psychiatric disorders, and we expect there to be subtypes. But to be honest, we haven't yet identified those subtypes. But again, you need the large data sets to, to be able to to investigate that. And that's something that could happen if we were to have, uh, you know, try and build um, genetic information into clinical practice so that you generate these large data sets which are realistic in realistic settings with that breadth of information. You know, of course, one of the things that people are very interested in is, you know, this precision psychiatry. How can we prescribe medications which are best suited to an individual? 
because we know that some medications work well for some people and not for others, and there's likely to be a genetic component to that. Um, and so ultimately, we'd hope to be able to pre, you know, generate predictive algorithms for that. But as I say, we don't yet have the data to be able to do that. But you know, we do have the technology, whereas 10 years ago, we didn't have the technology. And so um, that's where we are. Perfect. So, so that, that gives us hope uh, to essentially enable, enable that precision medicine in psychiatry and try to understand the underlying risk factors, the underlying causes um, behind those different uh, subtypes of, of the disease, if they uh, indeed exist. We are doing this show for you and your feedback is very important for us. So if you have any suggestions or comments, would like us to cover a specific topic or recommend a guest please write us an email to team at pmedcast.com. Or you can reach out to us on LinkedIn, Twitter, or Facebook. Just type in Personalized Medicine Podcast and you will find us there. To download the show notes for this episode, visit our website, pmedcast.com. It's p-m-e-d-c-a-s-t dot com. The show notes include guest bios, links to their most notable work, and recommendations for additional reads on the topic of the episode. Make sure to check them out. And don't miss the next episode. Subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcasting platform. Give us a rating and leave a comment. It will help us make this show better. And now, let's get back to the interview. Another aspect that I would like to discuss with you in this interview is essentially the ethics of applying PRS in healthcare. On one hand, a polygenic risk score might be treated as a deterministic factor, and uh, patients might think that uh, there is nothing that they can do uh, to, to fight their disease just because they're predisposed to it. So how can we best explain to the patients the implications of the genetic predisposition to the diseases? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very important question. And uh, to be honest, that's one of the key reasons I invited Janine Austin to be um, a contributor in our opinion paper, because, you know, this is the field that, that she specifically works in and specialises in. And so, you know, I think I've made it clear that polygenic risk scores are not deterministic. Uh, they are predictive, but obviously the way people respond is is uh, they've got to understand that, that piece of information. And so clearly there's going to be need to be education for, for everyone, um, including doctors. Um, and you're right, I think people, you know, individuals respond to the same piece of information differently. So you could tell two people that they've got a high polygenic risk score and one could respond in a way that, oh, um, I'm made this way, I can't change it, so I won't bother to try. And other people would say, oh, phew, now I've got an explanation uh, this motivates me now, I'll really try to adopt lifestyles that will help me counter this. So, you know, I think Janine's view is that with the right education, polygenic risk for information can be communicated to people in a way that's useful for each individual, but, but you need training of, uh, uh, of specialists for that as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, one, more, one more thing that I wanted to discuss with you is, um, since we are advancing in our technology, it gets easier for us to generate those large genetic data sets. But uh, how easy do you expect to, to actually analyze those data? Because it is one thing to, to actually generate the data, but another one to extract the meaningful information from them. And those genetic data sets are so massive. Uh, so how can scientific community come together in the most meaningful way to actually get a hang of that data and uh, extract the most value out of them? Um, well, those data sets are massive, but I guess as many, uh, it's the last 10 years has generated more data. It's also generated more scientists. We we have the tools to analyze the data. And as the data increases in size and complexity, we generate the tools. So I, I don't think that's the limiting factor. The limiting factor is actually the clinical samples and the data from those clinical samples. So, uh, and that's why we have to be trying to work hand in hand so that uh, it's not just research cohorts where we get data from, but it's actually um, uh, real clinical data is contributing to research. Understood. And uh, essentially that collaborations between clinicians and uh, research scientists, on the other hand, would be crucial to kind of 
understand the the, the meaning behind the data. Uh, yes, and that, and that's happening. Um, but there's only you know the data. One individual research clinician can only generate so much data. I mean, it's it's very time consuming, and so we have to think of ways to be you know, accessing data from electronic health records and bringing it together with genetic data so it's kind of routine um, rather than generating research cohorts per se. Understood. And you've been a part of many international consortia on uh, different psychiatric diseases. What is your experience in terms of collaborative environment that scientists go through on, on those uh, large uh, projects? Do we do already enough uh, of uh, collaborations between different regions, between different institutions, or there is still room for the improvement? Uh, as I say, I think the psychiatric genetics field is very collaborative and has been a kind of a flagship to other uh, other diseases and disorders. Um, you know, there's always more that can be done and, you know, collaboration one has to work at. Um, but I think when everyone's motivated for the same goal, you realize that actually working together is the right thing to do. Perfect. And uh, Naomi, I would like to take a short outlook with you to the future. So I want to ask you, what are the three developments that you wish to see happening in the next 10 years in the field of genetics and uh, kind of the, the genetic research that is related to, to neurological disorders. Okay, so um, you know, what the genetic studies of the last 10 years have shown, have identified for us, are DNA variants which are associated with a trait, so like schizophrenia. What the next generation of studies are starting to generate, and these are starting to come out now, are data sets where we look at the expression of genes in different cell types. So, and that's very, very exciting. So you're looking at, um, you know, for example, different neuronal cells from the brain, looking at the expression of those different cell types, and then collecting that data in enough individuals where you also have their DNA data. And so then you can identify the DNA variants which control variation in gene expression between people in individual cell types. And when you have those data sets, you can then put them together with our um, DNA variant schizophrenia data sets and say, we've identified these DNA variants associated with schizophrenia, which cell types are they um, actually important for? So I think the next 10 years is really going to be um, this leveraging of different types of data sets is using humans for human research in a way that's not been possible before. So I, I think that's going to be very important. And you know, the recognition of the contribution of individual variation. So you know, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves is the, why has there been so few new drugs developed for common complex diseases? And this isn't just the psychiatric disorder, it's actually you know, very much across the board for, for many common disorders. And it may well be that, you know, a drug has been developed which is good for some people and not others. And so can we identify in advance the people who should go on to the clinical trials who are likely to be the ones who respond to a drug? So I think that's a development that we might see in the next uh, next uh, phase. Great, yeah, that that would be fantastic, and uh, I think what you just mentioned when um, let's say the cell biology and the recent advancements uh, there, in, especially in the stem cells and use pluripotent stem cells, come together with the new advances in uh, genomics and genetics, that that could be very very powerful. So I know that uh, you have a very successful career, and uh, for sure you influenced a lot of young scientists who work with you. At least I know a few, uh, and uh, I would like to ask you uh, to give an advice to to young PhD students and postdocs who are listening to this podcast and just starting their career in research. Perhaps um, something that you wish you knew when you were just starting. Oh, tricky. Um, well, I would say that I had three careers, and so I think people get a bit fixed on you know are they doing the right thing, whereas. In fact, I've changed very much from the thing I did. You know, my first degree was actually in agriculture. So 
uh, I've now come quite a long way. Um, so I think that's important for people to know that, you know, doing research, actually, you can go down many pathways and end up in a, in a different place really, as you pull together different bits of your expertise. Um, uh, what else? So other bits of advice. Well, I think often young scientists feel the competition, the heat, you know, they look at other people and think, oh, they're doing better than I am. And I think you just have to ignore that. You just have to put your head down, get on and do your own thing and believe in yourself. And, and you know, part of success then I think is actually being a finisher that I think that often um, there's a lot of research that gets conducted and people don't know when to bite it off and say, that's the end. I need to write that up because it's no good doing uh, good research and not communicating it to other people. So I think, yeah, being a fish finisher, knowing when to, to stop and write up is important. Um, another bit of advice I think would be to try and carry multiple threads. You know, we, research is about not knowing what the answer is. And so it's very common to start researching, going down one field and realize you've come to a dead end that, and actually your idea wasn't a good idea. Well, that's research, you didn't know it at the beginning. And uh, so if you can carry on multiple threads, then you're more likely to have, you know, to make sure you have something that, that works at any particular time. And as part of those threads, so I always think it's good to try and carry on an idea that's actually your own. That I think uh, young researchers often employed to work on particular projects, but if they can also have their own ideas and try and progress those at the same time. Is that enough? <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that's fantastic, and uh, there are a lot of gems there. And uh, personally, as uh, as a PhD graduate, I can also relate to many things that you mentioned, uh, especially about following different threads. Because, um, as you said, uh, so many times we end up at a dead end, uh, and it's okay. That's a part of science. Um, and I also could not agree with you more on the f uh, first thing that you said that. People should not be afraid of change and uh, change in the fields uh, of their research uh, and uh, exploring uh, something new because that's that's how one learns. Yeah, too true. <laughs> Perfect. So yeah, and thanks a lot for for for, for sharing your wisdom. I'm sure I'm sure our uh, audience will will certainly dig into that. And uh, the last question before I let you go, I want to uh, let you our audience know. How can they reach out to you? Where can they find you online? Oh, oh yeah, sure. Um, well, they, I'm, I'm very searchable online. Um, you can find me, find my email address, naomi.ray at uq.edu.au. Very happy to receive emails. Um, well, thanks for having me, Alexander. Well, Naomi, this was my pleasure. Thank you so much for, for finding time to, to speak to me today. It was a pleasure talking to you, and thanks a lot for sharing your insights on the genetic risk factors uh, in psychiatric disorders. And uh, I hope we'll be able to discuss this topic again soon. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much for being with us today on the Personalized Medicine Podcast. If you like this show and know someone who would enjoy it too, please share this podcast with them. And don't miss the next episode yourself. Subscribe to the Personalized Medicine Podcast on your favorite podcasting app. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and many, many more. Please rate us there and leave a comment. That helps us to grow and deliver the best experience to you. To access the show notes for this episode, visit our website, pmedcast.com. It's p-m-e-d-c-a-s-t dot com. And engage with us on social media where we regularly share the news and exciting content on personalized medicine. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook just by typing in Personalized Medicine Podcast. Or use our handle, PMATCAST. And if you have any feedback or would like to suggest a guest for the show, write us an email to team at pmatcast.com. Have a great day and until next time.